gonna try to make this an annual event, like I said. Corey Gates here, the master meteorologist. And uh, we're hoping he's gonna get it right again this year. Last year, he was a little off. Me and him got in a little argument. I'm like, hey, if we could take May and put it in January, where we like 5.5 inches of snow, whatever it was, right? And it was horrible. We had six weeks of dry weather from New Year's all the way through Valentine's Day. And we all know it, but besides that, it was a pretty good winter, and we got a lot of moisture in May, and I had some of my best days in May, I don't know about you, but I traveled through the snow, and I skied up here, and it was great. Um, what a great end of the season after the lifts closed. Hopefully this year, we'll keep it all before the lifts close. I'm gonna send it over to a true gentleman and a really good forecaster, meteorologist, Corey Gates. Hey guys, how are you? Tell me you read it every day when you wake up. Come on now, every morning, sister. That a girl. All right, so let me finish. Ryan was supposed to do this too, but he got he's nervous. <laughs> so new for this fall. I have been promising this airport indicator thing for months. You guys read it. You know how frustrated I am because the guy can't get it done. But by October 1st, we're gonna have it. So if you haven't joined the site, I would join just because of this. I'm gonna tell you the parameters that the airport lands planes and doesn't land planes by. I'm gonna give you a detail, like, it'll be right, as to why the planes are gonna land today and why they're not. And it's gonna be out for three days, like today, tomorrow, and the next day. And that's hard. Yeah, what I do. Oh, uh, okay. so, so, so that's going to be an important thing for this fall. Uh, let's see, what else? We're streamlining the credit card process because Ryan is battered every day with 50 emails. This card is expiring today, let's, and then we have to get a hold of people, do this, that, and other. So we're going to make it easier where if your card expires, you can just go back in and fix it if you're a, if you're a recurring member. All right, so let's... <laughs> this is not good for me to talk about because I don't like what's the, I, that's why I just want to be humble about it but the last few winters we've done good last winter we were 10 off at Snowmass but we were 30 inches off at Aspen Mountain and Aspen Highlands it snowed more at Snowmass the previous winters it's just an inch or two and that was seven months in advance I'm just going to say yay instead of <laughs> instead of say, oh my God, I'm the king, because that's not the truth. But we're really close, and I'm gonna be close this year, and I'm getting ready to tell you why. All right, so, right now we are in the midst of a strong El Nino. Really, to be quite honest, it's very strong. There's only been three sh very strong El Ninos since records have been kept. The far right side of the screen, 1982-83, 1997-98. Basically, what this chart shows you, I just wanted to show it to you just to, to get off the ground. It shows you all the weak, moderate, strong, and very strong El Ninos that, that we've had since the 50s when we started keeping track of it. On the left side, and I tried to make it as big as possible, you can see the snowfall for each winter. Here's the critical one. This winter is going to be a very strong El Nino. So, we've only had two. Those are snow totals in town. 216 in 1982-83 is a, uh, I can't cuss, it's a lot. 97-98, we had 188 inches in town. Now you can double that easy for the resorts, because that's how it goes. At 8,000 feet, you get 216 inches. At, at 11,300 feet, you're gonna get 400 inches. So, so we have an idea, at least, of the past when you have a very strong El Nino. We've only had two cases, which statistically is not the best, but it's better than not, It's better than having zero. So the past two cases that we've had, those were the snow amounts. So that's essentially what this chart's all about. I'll try to keep it so you can hear it. All right, Ryan, next one. Here's something a lot of people ask me. It has nothing to do with what I'm getting ready to tell you. If you want 
snowfall data for every single solitary year, and I mean accurate snowfall data since 1934, all you have to do, I couldn't fit all the years on there, so I just, I cropped it from 82, 83 on. This is what, if you, if you Google Aspen Water Department, and once that comes up, you'll see a thing that says weather records, and then click snowfall 1934 to present. You will get it every single solitary month for almost 100 years. I use this all the time because you're looking back at certain years, like, you know, C1982-83, there's that 216. That's where that number comes from. C1997-98, there's where that 188 comes from. So this is the water plant. It's a little bit higher than town, but it's very representable. So Aspen Water Department, and then click weather records, and then snowfall 1934 to present. It's great information if you're just looking. All right. So here we go. Let's talk about El Nino. First of all, I'm gonna I'm gonna discourage I mean, Now I, th th tonight's talk's not gonna be about global warming, because y'all don't want to know where I stand on global warming because I do not like it. But here is an example of what global or, or what El Ninos have done since we've kept track of them. This is not made up science, this is accurate. NCEP. NCEP means National Center for Environmental Prediction. So here's what's going on. You can see from the chart, it goes up and down. You see me doing that stupid motion, up and down. The El Nino, the warmth of the Pacific this year is unfreaking real. It's fantastic. But it's not, it has nothing to do with man-made climate change. And you can tell just by the graph. Look at the peaks. After 97, 98, the very next winter, what did it do? It went to almost two degrees below normal. Big peak here, what did it do next winter? Dropped dramatically. Big strong one here, what did it do next winter? Hideous drop. So do you see a trend? Big El Nino here, next winter, over a degree below normal. Big El Nino here, next winter, the Pacific cooled hideously. Big one, cool. Big one, cool. There's another huge one here. The next winter, much colder. So the whole, the whole point I'm trying to make is it's not man-made. The warming of the Pacific Ocean is cyclical. It's a two and three year cycle. It goes up and it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. It doesn't matter how much freaking CO2 is in the atmosphere. It doesn't matter with any of that. That's just what the ocean does. When I'm getting ready to show you graphics of the ocean temperatures out there, and they are hot. They're warm. This is going to be the first, second, or third strongest ever out there. But I can guarantee you, when you all are here next winter at this very same time, there's going to be blues all over the map. The Pacific's going to cool dramatically, and that will lower this kind of balminess factor that we're in right now. The Earth will cool again starting next year. You may not believe me, but I'm telling you it will. These graphs don't lie. It goes up and down. All right, so this is critical. Probably the second most critical slide you'll see the entire night. This is the United States, west coast. This is the Pacific Ocean. This is the date line where the time changes, okay? So the, the glaring thing of that is look at all the orange and the red and the deep reds. The Pacific Ocean is warm. It's very warm. That's why we're having a strong El Nino. Where the El Nino takes place is not up here. This is the mid-latitudes, 30 and 40 degrees north. The El Nino is an equator-bound thing. It's, it's a tropical entity. So when you're off the coast of Chile, and you go all the way across the entire Pacific Ocean, look at how warm this water is. That it, that's really on the verge of incredible. It's very warm. It's over, the, I couldn't even get the scale on there, but it's two and a half to three Celsius above normal. Three Celsius is like 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, the Pacific Ocean in the first 200 feet below the top is very warm. So that's critical to the forecast as to what's gonna happen this winter. So 
So just get a glimpse of this. Starting last winter, here's something else that's very important. So we already know the equator is hideously warm. It's just freaking warm. There's convection along the equator. There's thunderstorms. That produces latent heat. It produces a feedback effect where moisture is driven northward into the mid-latitudes. And it creates what's called baroclinicity. That's a great word. All, all baroclinicity is is a temperature gradient. So this winter, the water doesn't get colder here in the winter. Along the equator, it's the equator. It's five degrees north. That water's going to stay balmier than hell. 80s all winter long. But what happens north of the equator is due to the fact that we have winter and you're in the middle latitudes, that water cools. So you're going to have an incredible temperature gradient between the equator and just to the north. Okay, but I'm going to come back to that later. I'm going to show you why, why that's important. Here's just a different. Here's just a different map. It's the same thing though. See the equator? Hideous warmth. And here's something that's very, very, very important. Last winter was the first winter in a long time that right off, Ryan, go back to that last one. Just hit back one more. This one. Here's the Pacific Northwest. See, here's Washington, then it comes down into California. Last winter was the first winter we've had in a long time where that water was super warm. I mean super warm. It wasn't as warm as the equator, because that's not going to happen at 45 degrees north. But it was really warm. So when you have really warm water in one spot, it creates a, a ridge. Can you hear me? Yeah. It, it creates a ridge aloft. So that dry spell that, that Ryan mentioned from January 1st, to, from New Year's Day to Valentine's Day, that was caused by this warm water off the west coast. Now I'm going to tell you what's going to happen with that warm water this winter here in a second. Okay, you can switch it. You can switch it. All right. So here's the deal with this. All this is, if you guys are members, you hear me talk about models all the time. There's the GFS model, there's the European model, there's the UK Met model, United Kingdom model, there's the NAM model. You've heard me talk about the Canadian Gem Global. I'm going to tell you one more in just a few minutes. But all these models have a feel for what's going to happen during the winter. And all this graph does is just verify the fact that that we're going to have an El Nino winter. This is 1.5 Celsius above normal, that's 2 Celsius. So here's the model spread of all the different models saying we're going to be really, really warm. And it peaks in the late fall from like December 1st to January 1st. And then in the spring, the El Nino starts to fall off a bit, which is very, very common. That's happened over the years. So that's just what that graphic represents. Moral of the story, extremely high confidence, 100 percent that we're going to have a strong El Nino. Not 99, it's 100%. No, go back to the one just before. So that's basically, this graph just basically shows you the same thing. See where we are now? Up near two Celsius above normal. It gets really, it peaks in the fall, and then it starts falling in the spring. And the black line is just the, the midway, or the mean, between all those stupid models I tell you about every day. So there, there's just no getting around it. You saw the graphic of the Pacific Ocean, how hot it was. You saw the equator, it's very hot. It's gonna be a large temperature difference across the Pacific, which is gonna create a strong jet. And the models are 100% sure of it, and so am I. So that, there's no debate. There will be a debate later, but I'll, I'll get there. So here is Noah's predictions. Just just so you see it, all right? On the left side, precipitation. On the right side, temperature. If you can't see it back there, this is September, October, November. So it's still the fall. The, the, the models that NOAA uses on the left side, any, anywhere you see a shade of green, they're forecasting above normal precipitation. On the, on the right side, temperatures are normal-ish. Here's the leading edge of the below. That's the leading edge of the warm. Aspen's right there. So normal. So Noah's prediction for the fall, a 
above normal precip, whether it be rain or snow, depending on elevation, and normal temperatures. Now let's go to the next one I'll give you. Corey forecast, baby. Here's, um, here's October, November, December. Damn, I couldn't even see it. <laughs> So on the right side now, damn, I loaded it wrong. On the right side is precipitation. So it still says late into the fall, October, November, December, above normal precip. You got it, which is all, all that all that corresponds to this El Nino, and I'm going to get to that when I give you the final details. On the right side, temperature is pretty close to normal. Next one, Ryan. The heart of winter. Noah's prediction: November, December, January. Aspen's right there. So they're predicting a, a little bit above normal precip. That's a great sign that Noah's thinking this. And I work for Noah. So Noah's not stupid, trust me. Even You guys might wake up every morning and say, God damn, that forecast sucks. I gotta read Corey, but whatever. You, <laughs> you, you have to understand. You're better than them in Grand Junction. He, here's the reason why their forecasts aren't quite as good. Right. I can concentrate on one spot. Noah has to go from Lake Creek and Powell all the way to Breckenridge, all the way to Steamboat, all the way to uh, Montrose, uh, Telluride, Wolf Creek. They have a huge area that they have to try to be accurate in, and then they divide it up into counties, and they just don't have the time. It's only an eight-hour shift when you work overnight for the weather service, because I did it for 20 years, and you don't, you're not able to get all the extreme details into that. So that's why they're not quite as good. But not that I don't like them. They're still meteorologists just like me, but they just are just beaten to hell every day because they have so much to think about in so many areas. So that's my, that's my NOAA thing. So, but as far as their long range outlooks, they're normally respectable. So the heart of winter, November, December, January was pretty good. Here's December, January, February, which is the true heart of winter. We're still close to the just above normal axis. Temperatures, we're right about there, so we're normal-ish. I can already tell you temperatures will be normal. So let's look at one more, and then I'm gonna give you the... Okay. This is the most important graphic of all. So have a, have a shot, have a beer. This is good, this is, this is critical. There's a model called the Jams Tech model. You guys hear me talk about the European model? The European is the best model in the world, probably, in the middle range. But the Jams Tech model is the best ocean model in the world. It stands for Japanese Agency for Marine Science Technology. They do incredible research. They bought their own boats. They measure the sea surface. They do a great job because Japan is a big fishing industry and that's where all this originated. But this this is the model's temperature prediction for the months of December, January, and February, okay? That is, I mean, obviously those months are critical, December, January, and February. The tourists are here, hotels are making money, everybody's keying. This is, this is what you have to get right. This model does the best job by far. It's not even effing close. They're super, super good. So, so, so what is it telling you? Along the equator, remember the graphics we just looked at? Remember how warm it was in the equator? That's not gonna change. You see that big blob of warmth, okay? Up along the west coast of North America from Vancouver down to Portland. See that, see that warm, warmness off the west coast? That is extremely critical. That's the only model that's recognizing. Remember the, remember the sea survey graphic I showed you how warm it was off the west coast? A lot of the models are trying to cool that water too much. It didn't happen last year. We're way above last year's pace. It's not going to happen this year. So the Jams Tech model is the closest. That's where that warm water is going to be. So two pockets of hideous warmth along the equator, along the northwest coast, and just off of Mexico. And here's what. Here's another thing that's important. The latest trends are the water out here. This is 180. That's the date line. That water in the last month is cooling fairly rapidly. 
That's very, very important. You can see that on the sea surface temperature, but I'll show you something else in a minute. So when this water cools, and, and, the, and all right, so here's the equator warm. You got it? North of the equator, the water's not nearly as warm. Do you see the white? That means it's just normal, and it's going to cool itself because of winter in general. So what will happen is all this hideous warmth is not going anywhere. This water is cooling right now. It's not that warm, and the trend is for it to cool a little bit more. Then winter sets in, it gets even colder. So between here and here, where this water's already cool, there's gonna be a strong jet. Do you understand why? It's that word again, baroclinicity. The difference in temperature is what drives the jet stream aloft. So obviously, there's a huge difference between this hideous and that colder and the trend of this water getting colder. That's why El Ninos are famous for a southern stream jet. They, that's in the past El Ninos, almost 100%. New Mexico, Arizona, Tahoe South, uh, uh, Wolf Creek, Telluride, Silverton. They're just epic winners for them because we have a southern stream jet. And what I'm trying to show you is the reason there is a southern stream jet, the difference between all this warmth, all this cool, it's going to drive the jet in between them both. And there's one other factor to consider. When you have this cool water up here, you're going to have a big upper air trough right here, shaped like a U, and then the ridge is going to be off the west coast. And this trough will move around. It doesn't actually, it's not just going to sit. I have a graphic of what it's going to look like, but it doesn't just sit there. So at times, this northern stream is going to amplify because this ridge is, you know what the black line stands for? 140. Do you guys remember me telling you about when you have a ridge at 140 west, it's going to snow like all holy hell. That happens no matter what. So you, so you see how close this warm water is to that black line. So if you get a, so at times we're going to have a ridge at 140 west this winter, and we're going to have northwest events. And then when those end, hopefully this southern stream jet, because of that warmth and that cold, is going to drive a jet across like that, and we're going to pick it up from the south. So we have two ways of getting good precipitation this winter. And I'm just trying to show you based on sea surface temperatures as to why we have two ways. One, this ridge is gonna be at 140 at times. Two, a big strong jet. Yep. Okay, so we have statistics for the winter. Remember, they've been occurring for 70 years, back since the low 50s. This is, during, our, during the falls in Colorado, out of all, did you remember the chart in the very beginning where I had all the El Ninos listed? 100% of the time, that is incredible statistical relevancy, October, November, and December are wetter than normal. Not 99, it's 100% of the time, and I see no reason why that's not gonna happen. During January and February, we stray either side of normal. It could be 20% could be below, could be 5% above, could be 10% below, could be 2% above. We, we're, we're near the normal in January and February. That's also like 95% of the time. El Ninos are very consistent and they repeat themselves. And during the spring months, March, April, May, just exactly like the spring. It was, it, El Nino springs are wet. And again, that's 100% of the time. Statistical relevancy since 1952 with El Ninos. So you can make a pretty good forecast just based on statistics, all right? So here, here is the Jams Tech model. Believe it or not, I'm almost done. There's only a few more to go. The Jams Tech model, like I told you before, is the king of, of baroclinicity and forecasting ocean temperatures. No, I'm not from Hartford. <laughs> Okay, so I had to look at it to get my bearings. So 
I want to show you how good I think the Jams Tech model is. Just a quick recap. Remember the last graphic? There's 100% statistical certainty that the falls are wet. So look at the Jams Tech model. It might be hard to see, but this is, this is a light green over Colorado, okay? So the Jams Tech is predicting a, a wetter fall over Colorado. Remember where we have the big ridge just off the west coast? Oregon, Washington, Shasta, North and Northern California, Montana. It's a dry fall, and that's exactly happening right now. There's big, hideous, nasty fires in California, Oregon, Washington, Western Montana, Glacier. And that, that dryness is gonna continue. So the model right now is doing a fantastic job. And it's predicting, so that's why I'm, I'm basically gonna use this model for the winter because it already has our fall characteristics. We already talked about October, November, December, above normal in the fall. That's what it's forecasting. So next screen. Here's December, January, February. Remember the last slide? I said January, February can go just slightly either side of normal. Well, look at the look at the jams tech. How do you be? I need a shot. Look, it has it has white. If you have white, you're just either side of that normal. So the jams tech is due. It, it's forecasting what El Ninos do. It actually is grasping the concept. Here's something else that's cool. Look at the dark green area near Tahoe. For God's sakes, California needs rain. They get it during strong El Ninos. So California, from the northern part down to the south, LA, Frisco, Tahoe, better normal this year. I can pretty much promise you that. Next one, Ryan. There's the jam text again for spring. This should, if you can see it, it should be ringing a bell. Remember I told you springs on that graphic are wet, 100% certainty with El Nino. Well, there comes the green again in Colorado, down by Wolf Creek in the southwest corner, wet in the plains. I'm not gonna bother with the east coast but it still stays drier up north. So, moral of this story, the European model, the GFS model, the Canadian Gem Global model, all these other global models, they did a pretty good job. Even those NOAA graphics that I showed you are okay. But this Jams Tech model is hitting what is really happening now and has a really good feel for the winter. Okay, so if we put all this together, remember, this is what I'm thinking the upper air pattern is going to look like. Remember, if you can, what the sea surface temperatures look like. Now, now, do you remember the cold pool that was up here when I showed you the sea surface temperatures? You remembered all the warmth of the equator, and you remembered all that warmth off the west coast, okay? So here's what the winter's going to look like. There's going to be a trough out here near 160 degrees west. That's what, remember the sea surface graphic? It's critical you remember that because that's where it was, you saw that patch of cold. So that's where the trough's gonna be. Remember the warm air just off of between, between 130 and 140. That's where the ridge is gonna be. This green area, remember, it's balmy at the equator. It cools off north of the equator. This is where that strong subtropical jet is gonna be. It's gonna be aimed just like this. It's gonna streak across the Pacific and go just like that. So we're, so this, basically this is telling you like what I was thinking before. We're gonna be vulnerable to two storm tracks. The one with the ridge off the west coast so you get disturbances come down from the northwest. The other is this southern storm track that goes across central and southern California, Arizona, New Mexico. So. That's why I think we're gonna have a pretty good winter. And I think I'm gonna be right. So, so let's go ahead and do the number part. Oh, Ryan's got the numbers, because he's, he's fired up now. All right, Corey, great job. Guys on the left side. Obviously, you have no morals. Anyway, let's go to uh, yeah, free beer, you know. Okay, snow mass. For the cumulative amount this year, I'm sure everybody can see it, but people that can't, normal is 328, I love how Corey puts it, ish. October 1 to May 1, we're going 358. That is way more than last year. 
that means many more powder days. And we're happy about that. Aspen Mountain, normal, 318-ish. October 1 to May 1st, 329. I'm feeling good about that, baby. That's going to be great. Highlands, normal, 322-ish. October 1 to May 1, we're going 333. And I'll tell you what, guys. This guy, I've been hanging out with him for a little while, and he's, uh, before we even started AspenWeather.net, he's made some crazy predictions, and I really think it's going to come true. It's going to be a great winter. Let's get out there and enjoy it. And in town, at the water plant, we always like snow in town because we have cross-country skiers, and we need snow down there. And in February last year, things were starting to really melt, and, uh, but we got some snow in March and April. It was good. 140 to 150 is your normal. October 1st through May 1st, we're going 171 in town. So that's going to be a lot more snow than last year. Everybody get out there and play. It's going to be a beautiful winter, baby. And thank you for everybody that's come out, whether you're a member or you're not. We're here to tell you and monetize your, your time outdoors. Thanks for coming, everybody. Drink up and have a beer on me.